Father, may you give him the bread to the other moon. Let's give the bread to the moon. And I have to say, you have to do that. And then, may you give one of the right to the moon to us. Amen. Amen. Yes, it is. <laughs> I think I'm plugged in. 61 years yesterday. Happy anniversary. 
Blessings on you, Janet. <laughs> wow, yeah, yeah. My, my Lord, has somebody you say been married all your life? Yeah, bless your heart. Well, congratulations. I tell you, that's a that's a major major milestone today. Yeah. Yeah, I bet we got time for them, John. If you want to tell us a few. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Through the through the ups and the downs. That's the way that's the way it goes. But wow, what a milestone. <clears throat> we at least you're not like that one fella. That one fella his wife woke up one morning. She heard him just a crying, just a pitiful cry. And she thought, well, what's the matter with him? So she got to looking for him. And she traced the sound of where the crying was coming from, and she went downstairs into the basement, and he was sitting in the corner beside the water heater, just a boo-hooing. And she said, honey, what's the matter? He said, well, I was just sitting here thinking. And she said, well, what are you thinking about that's so depressing? He said, well, he said, this is our 20th wedding anniversary today. She said, well, yeah, I know that. And she said, it what what's you know what you upset about that for? He said because if I hadn't married you, I'd be getting out of jail today. <laughs> well, you can, you didn't figure that one into it, but it's just. Uh, I guess that guy still married told me that. I don't know. Now that you ask it, man. Well, we're in, we're in chapter twenty one, man. We're blazing through this thing. We're into the good part now. We done got through all that tribulation and. And all that rough stuff, and now we're we're getting we're getting introduced in, into the eternity. We're just gonna it's just like we're on a downhill slide right in right into eternity. This is encourage this is the encouraging part of this book. It's all uplifting and encouraging, but these last two chapters, I mean they really they really just, just bring it home for you. So I had put last week we'd go one through five, I think, on the verses, but actually we're gonna go one through eight. Uh, because there's no use just leaving those those other couple ones out because they just kind of fit into the introduction here. But in chapter 21, verses 1 through 8, we're going to look at it and we'll look at the what, what I call here the introduction to the eternal dwellings that we're going to be in. And John wrote, he said, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and also there was no more sea. And then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. <clears throat> and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, it is done. Where have we heard those words before? On the cross. It is finished. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So we're going to talk about He gives us an introduction 
to where we're going to be in eternity. Father, we thank You tonight for these who are able to be with us here in the sanctuary. And we thank You for those who are tuned in on the Facebook here this evening. And ask blessings upon those who may go back and watch the recording either here or on our webpage or on YouTube, wherever they may pick it up. I know that You, Holy Spirit, can guide and direct the lesson to them just as You do to us. So help us tonight to see that which we need to see as, as a church and as individuals that this might stir something in us to bring out our evangelism side so that we can go out and and try to try to let people know that this is going to really happen and we don't know how soon but it looks like it won't be long so i just pray right now for those who don't know you that we as your disciples would help them to come to know you and we'll give you the thanks in jesus name we pray and we love you lord amen and amen all right, <clears throat> on your notes, I, I put there in a the paragraph, <laughs> I said the movie's coming to an end for John. And boy, what a happy ending it's going to be. He's He's been through some things, hadn't he? He's had a lot of things you know, shown to him. As we said in the beginning when we started these lessons, I don't know if if the Lord uh, you know, showed all this to John that, you know, like over one setting or like over one period of time, or if there were many visitations or, or many things that, that he may have just put in his heart or showed him the visions at different times throughout, throughout the writing of the book. But one thing about it <clears throat> is I'm sure John is glad to see the end of this thing and how it turns out since he's seen how the, how the beginning was. Now, we all live happily ever after, but now this is not a fairy tale. <laughs> that is really the truth. That's really the truth. We will live happily ever after, and we're talking about those who, who are in Christ. Now, this is what you and I have to look forward to following our life here on this planet today. So that's why when we begin to see things that, that are getting worse and the times grow worse and men's hearts get worse and you know, it's it's not going to always be that way. There there will be an end to it. And those who put their trust in Christ and are born again and have that rebirth of the Spirit, we're we're getting ready to see in these last two chapters, here's what you and I have to look forward to. Now these first eight verses here tonight, they introduce us to to our eternal dwelling place. And then the remainder of the verses will give us intimate details of the structure which John sees here. You know, I've told you all along, it's, it's interesting the way the book is written. It's like we're, we're told what's going to happen, and then we're given details of, of what does happen and how it plays out. So it's going to be, it's going to be interesting as we finish these last two chapters. All right, let's look at verse 1. Verse 121, John said, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and also there was no more sea. A new heaven and a new earth. Isaiah prophesied that in chapter 65 and verse 17. Now if you want to turn there, if somebody wants to turn there and, and look at that, and read it for us, and we'll we'll see exactly what Isaiah said. It's it's not going to be, <clears throat> I think, news to us as far as what we see here in the Revelation, but it's it's interesting to know that even in the days of Isaiah, he saw the same things which John is seeing here today. Isaiah sixty five and seventeen. Anybody got that? All right, Mary. I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Aren't you glad of that? Aren't you glad that when we when we're there in, in 
in this new Jerusalem when we're there, in this new heaven and this new earth, that we're not going to have a recollection or a memory of, of what's going on now and how our life has been here. And it's just going to be, I think it's one of the hardest things for us to grasp because we're, you know, being human, our minds are limited to what we can, well, maybe not what we can imagine, but what we can actually figure out. But we've never seen a glorified body. And this is the only mind we have ever known. The mind that we have now is the only one we have ever known. But all that's going to be changed. When, when we're in that glorified body, and our minds have, <laughs> have been totally renewed by the Holy Spirit, and it's a complete change, we're we're not gonna we're not gonna have any part of who we are now as being a part of that. We're we're all going to be children of God. And I know that's hard that, that's hard for us to encompass. When I may have told you I taught a Bible study to, to a group of, of senior ladies at an apartment Glenda used to manage, and I'd go and do the Bible study and you know what they wanted to study? Revelation. Everybody yeah. So we were talking about that. <clears throat> And she said, well, I hope when I get to heaven that, that me and my husband have a nice mansion, you know, when we get there. And I said, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's going to be any marriages in heaven because Jesus said, you know, we'd be like the angels. And the angels don't procreate or, you know, they're... It's, she said, you mean I ain't going... He ain't going to be my husband up there? I said, well... No, he's going to be God's child, and you're going to be God's child, and it's going to be in that. She said, well, that ain't right. I said, listen, listen, just trust God with that one, okay? Because he knows, he knows how that's going to carry out. Yeah, we're going to know, but we're not going to have that recollection to where we're going to be able to say who is who, or who was who, or who belongs to who. It's, it's all a glorified body. It's hard for us to imagine that now because we have, we do have the human, uh, you know, relationships and, and the feelings and all that that goes, but none of that's going, none of that's going to be there. This earth is not going to be renovated. Neither is the heaven going to be renovated. They're both going to be brand new, brand new. There will be no corruption in this new heaven, as there was with the first one. There was corruption in the first heaven. And there's not going to be no corruption in this new earth as there was with the first earth. Do you know where the corruption was with the first earth? The one we're living in now. Where, where was that corruption? Garden of Eden. What about the corruption in heaven? What was that? Lucifer got kicked out. Lucifer raised... Huh? No, it was before it was before the earth was created. The one that we live in now. Yeah, it was. Now there there's a lot of there's a lot of theology. Well I don't know if it's necessarily theology. There's a lot of school of ideas of, of how how it all came about. Uh, some some believe that that God created the earth uh, and earth, and that when Satan was kicked out, he brought it to destruction. I don't believe that. I, I don't think God would have said, go destroy that earth. And then he made this one. I don't believe that. But he was kicked out before this earth was formed because he was in the garden. He wasn't just created in the garden. He was there after the earth was created. So <clears throat> that's where the corruption took place in that heaven. And of course, we read in this book, remember that Michael and his angels warred with the, the devil and his angels and, and they were all cast out. So there was corruption in the first heaven and there was corruption in the first earth. Not going to be so in this new heaven and this new earth. There's not going to be any corruption. And there's not going to be a sea. There is there's not going to be no sea. Also, there was no more sea. I don't know why. I, I don't know if that's if that's something to symbolically that that we need to think about or what all that is, you know, and get into it. All I know is there ain't gonna be no sea, and that's fine with me. You know, I mean, it's 
<clears throat> but anyhow, I'll look at verse 2. Then I, John, personalized it. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride who is adorned for her husband. You, you know, when you look at this, once when, it, when, I, when I saw it, you know, I think when, when John testifies, then I, John, saw the holy city. Wonder why he would make a point of, of saying, I personally saw this holy city. Wonder what he would make a point of that. You, you think maybe it's because, you know, he was getting this revelation through Christ's angel. Remember when we started back when we started this back over in chapter one? In chapter one, the first verse, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants things which which must shortly take place, and he sent and he signified it or messaged it by his angels to his servant John. So it, I think, I think John's just saying up until this point, this is just me. I think John was trying to get him to understand that this this is not just a made up type vision. This is just not a symbolic type thing. John says, I'm not writing symbolically here. But he said, I saw this new Jerusalem. I seen it, as we would say, with my own eyes. I don't know who else's eyes we would see it with, but we would say it, I saw it with my own eyes. And he said, I saw it coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Probably going to be the new heaven that he sees that throne coming down or he sees this city coming down out of, wouldn't you think? Because first the, new, the, the old earth and the old heaven had passed away and now it's a new heaven and a new earth. So out of the new heaven, John sees this city which is coming down from God. But no doubt... It's always been there. Uh, you, you know, the city's always been. He didn't just create it when he created this new earth or this new heaven. The city was there and it, and it came down. If you turn to Hebrews chapter 11, let's look at verse 10. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 10. <clears throat> I'll show you where we get that from. Let's uh, let's actually start reading <clears throat> at verse eight, so we'll we'll get the context of it. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Boy, that's faith, isn't it? God said, "Just come out of there, Abraham. Just just come out of Ur, and I'm gonna." show you where you need to go. Verse 9, By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. He, he's waited for the city. Now Abraham passed. That's why it says in Hebrews, a lot of them died not receiving the promises that they're going to receive them. So Abraham knew that God was going to prepare a city of where he, his people was going to be. That's a long time before this is actually going to happen. But it's really going to take place. And this, this city, John said, when I saw it come down, it was prepared as a bride is adorned for her husband. The city is going to be given unto the Lamb, just as a bride is given to a groom. 
John said they'd been married 61 years. I bet he can still remember the day he laid eyes upon that bride when they were standing in front of that preacher. Say yes, John. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Yes, he remembers it well. He remembers it well. Vernon McGee, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, the late Vernon McGee, he said as a pastor he had the opportunity to, to do several weddings. and I've been blessed to do that too. And Vernon said he had never seen an ugly bride. He said, I had never seen an ugly bride. Because when the bride is, is adorned, and she's, she's got that gown on, and she's, they, they just, it's just radiance. You know, in, in the weddings when I do that, and <clears throat> when they start the music, and I usually come out with the groom, or sometimes we come down the aisle, depending on how they want to do it. But the only people really looking at, at me and the groom is usually the groom's mother. You know, she's usually looking and smiling at him because she's proud of him. But everybody else, they're waiting on the main attraction. Uh, and when the door is open, and just about the time I say, would you stand, when everybody starts to stand, all of them look towards the back because they know who's coming when I do that. And, and it's a, I mean, there's, there's just, it's just a sacred kind of moment, you know, when that happens and, and that bride's coming. It's a, it's a special event. So by John choosing to use that language to describe that, that's pretty intimate, isn't it? Uh, I mean, that should give you a real good, feel-good, you know, squishy-type feeling of, of, of how much God really wants us to be with Him. I mean, seriously. You know, I've said I don't understand how I can be a man and be a bride, but listen, if I'm going to be married to Jesus, I'll do it His way. So that, that's the way it's going to take place, and that's the way it's going to happen but I understand what John is talking about when, when he says that he saw her or he saw this city coming down as a bride which was adorned for her husband. So it's, it's good language. It's all positive language. There, there's, nothing, there's nothing you know that takes away from what's going to happen. Verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from heaven, and a loud voice from heaven said, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself will be with them, and be their God. I think He's talking about the Father here, don't you? I think He's talking about the Father. Now we know the Son, the city is given over to the Son, but we know that we can't separate the Lord Jesus Christ from God the Father. But we know that God the Father is what? He is Spirit. So it's not like God the Father has a body other than the glorified body of who? Jesus. See, that, that's the glorified body in which God dwelt when He sent Christ to earth. He dwelt in that body. He killed that body. Now it's glorified body. So by being a glorified body, still a part of God. That's why Jesus said in His prayer in the garden in John chapter 17, He said, I pray, Lord, that they might be one in us like I in You and You in Me that they may be in us. That's when it's going to happen. That, that's when that prayer that Jesus prayed in the garden is going to be answered. Is when this day comes and, and God comes upon this new earth that He's created and He dwells with us. He will be in us. We will be in Him. And that's going to be a happy day. Oh, happy day. Doug Patterson was here, Don. I'd have him sing it. Pastor Doug. Good. It's going to be a good time. Now, God visited His first humans in the Garden of Eden. He visited with them, didn't He? But one day, He's going to dwell with us. It's not just going to be a visitation. It's going to be a constant dwelling. So, that's, that's why I always say it simply, he started with perfect people in a perfect world and He's going to end up with perfect people in a perfect world. That's His plan. 
We're in between there right now. Now, we had no choice of, of becoming a part of this one. That, that wasn't, it wasn't by choice. Even though Hannah tells us that when, when God sent her to us, you know, we, we had adopted the boys, and then here come Hannah, and she told us, I don't know, she was probably about five one day, and just out of the blue we were talking, and she said, yeah, she said, I used to make crayons in Ohio. I'm just kind of looking, where did that kid get this from? And, uh, it really, yeah, and, and, then, and then I was put on a cloud and sent here. <laughs> and I thought, that's kind of scary. I ain't going to get into that too deep. Especially about being put on the cloud and sent here. Because <laughs> there's a lot of prayers that went up for a young'un. <laughs> so I don't know, I don't know if, if old high was on high, but who knows. But anyhow, what I know is He is going to dwell with us and it's not just going to be a visitation. It's going to be the fact that He, he is going to be with us and we're going to be with Him. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 37. Good old Zeke. Ezekiel chapter 37. And we're going to look at verse 27. I hope I didn't get them backwards. Possibly. Ezekiel 37 and 27. All right. 37 and 27. Ezekiel writes these words. My tabernacle, this is God speaking to Ezekiel, my tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. Whew. Not going to leave them anymore. Going to dwell <clears throat> Jews and Gentiles alike. All the people of God would be with Him. He'll be our God and we're going to be His people. Verse 4, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There should be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crime. There should be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. The former things. The joy of being in eternity with God. No more sorrow. No more dying. No more crying. No more hurt feelings. Ain't going to be anybody up there mad. Ain't, ain't nobody going to be mad. Ain't, ain't going to have to worry about you know, wild men losing their minds and killing you. All, listen, all that's going to be gone. None of that's going to exist. It, it's, not going to, it's not going to be a part of that eternity. Isaiah says in chapter 25 and verse 8, I'm going to flip over there and read it to you real quick. In Isaiah 25 and 8, he saw that and he prophesied that. He just he didn't understand at the time probably what it was when he prophesied it because the nation of Israel never saw that kind of peace. But in 25 and verse 8, he says, He will swallow up death forever. He will swallow up death forever. God will swallow it up. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the rebuke of His people and He will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. So that, that's how we know there's not going to be any recollection of what we go through here that we would carry as baggage over there. I may have told you the story that I ran into a lady when I first started pastoring here and and didn't get off on the right foot. And anyway, uh, they had left the church and I ran into them at Walmart one day and I spoke and they didn't speak. And they just kind of... So I stopped and I went back and that Ivanhoe smile, I went back and I said, you may not speak to me here, but God's going to make you speak to me when we get to heaven. So you just let's get ready. And she laughed. <laughs> she laughed. Well, it's true. It... See, and I didn't say if you go. I didn't add that on it. I just, because <laughs> I got to get there too, you know. But I just said, when, it, when we get there, you may not acknowledge me here, but yeah, he'll make you do it up there. You ain't going to bypass me when we, get, when we get up there. That's the joy of the eternity with God. So Isaiah saw that. 
No weeping and gnashing of teeth. No more tears. No pain from being burned in a fiery lake. See, once you're here, once you're here, you're not going to have to worry about messing up and being kicked out. Once you're there, you're there. Why? Because the rebellion has been cast where? Into the lake of fire that burns with brimstone. That, that's, where all, that's where all the anti-Christ doctrines and rebellions are going to end up. If, if something is not just put into your mind at a particular time, if it's not there, very few of us think of everything. There, there are things that come to our minds that we think about that is totally out of character for us sometimes, isn't it? You, you ever had that thought that just you just say, this is not like me. You ever, you ever had a thought come to you and you think, where did that come from? You know, how did that... Now, I'm not saying when you're mad and you start thinking, because all kinds of thoughts come when that happens. But I'm saying you, you're on a clear blue day on a normal Tuesday and everything's going good. And you're just, maybe you're praying or reading the Bible or maybe you're just driving down the road or working in your flower garden. or You know, you don't have your mind on any one particular. And all of a sudden, this terrible thought will come. And you think, where did that come from? Well, it's the tempter. It's what the devil does. And if you don't believe that, you need to believe that. Because he is able to do that. He is able to, to cause us to, to think things that we normally wouldn't think. That's why Paul made it a point to tell the Romans, the Roman Catholic Church, he made it a point to tell them, you got to renew your mind by the renewing of the Spirit, by the rebirth. That's why Jesus said you got to be born again. Because if you don't have that rebirth, then you don't have the mind of Christ. You don't have the Holy Spirit telling you. You ain't going to know which voice to listen to. I saw a t-shirt one day a guy had on. And he was a nice looking chap. I mean, he didn't look to be a mean dude. But the t-shirt said, I hear voices in my head. you know, And then under it, and it said, they don't like you. So I, I went down the next aisle. You know. <laughs> Glad he's given me a warning. I mean, I, you know, I don't want to have that happen. So, so those thoughts are there, but in that world, in that new heaven, and in that new earth, and in our glorified bodies, and with Christ, that's not going to be a problem. We're, we're not even going to have an inkling of what evil is. Isn't that going to be good? See, Eve, Eve got the knowledge from the tree of good and evil. She should have never done that. But she did. And it's still running rampant through humanity today. Good and evil. There's good in people and there's evil in people. That, that's why I, I say all the time, when you, you, know, you see one of these bad murderers or whatever it is that they do, and, and you think how awful that person is, and you know, you know we have the same capability. We're, we're just as degraded as a human as they, as they are. We make better choices hopefully, but, but we still have, have the ability. But there, that's not, going to be, that's not going to be the case. There's not going to be any, even within the angels, you know, in, in the first heaven, the angels that rebelled with Satan. It, it was an opportunity. They could do that. There's not going to be any rebellion in this new heaven. They're not going to know anything about rebellion. They're not going to know anything about evil. They don't even know there's a Lucifer. You know, all that is gone. Isn't that going to be good? That you don't have to, you know, you don't have to worry about that. that that's that, that's a good reason to go right there. <laughs> it will be new creatures in a new environment, and no resemblance to this one. These bodies that we live in here were designed to live on this planet, and that's how that's why we live as we do with the earth. But <clears throat> when we're in the glorified body. We're going to be designed to live in that world, in that earth, and and with that heaven. And it's not going to be it's not going to be the separate part. We're going to get into that. We get into the rest of these chapters. It's not going to be like heavens up there and earth down here, and it's still going to be separated. No, it, it's all going to be uh, it's all going to be the fact. If it is, some believe that there will still be there will still be a heaven up here. Could very well be, but if there is, 
we, we can still be a part of both of them. I mean, wherever it is, we're, we're going to be in that environment. I know it's hard to, to see ourselves that way, but that's just, that's just how it's going to work out. I'm glad God's in charge of all that, aren't you? <laughs> now, what were the former things that, that he said that there's not going to be any there? Former things have passed away. What are the former things that have passed away? Well, <clears throat> I think we read them down there in verse 8. But before we get to verse 8, the former things that have passed away is the sinful things. That's the former things. Before the new heaven and new earth, there was the sinful earth and the heaven that had the corruption. I know that's that's tough, but that's that's how it that's how the Bible teaches it. So the former things, the sinful things, will be passed away, being punished, as we will see in verse five. Then he who sat on the throne said, "Now who's sitting on the throne?" Mm-hmm. And Jesus is at the right hand, right? Behold, I make all things new. All things. And He said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. The Almighty on the throne who made all of the first things are going to make all of these things. See, when you get when you get caught up, and, and it's easy even for Christians to say, well, how could a, a God who, who loves children so much allow them to be abused? How, how, how could a loving, caring God allow bad things to happen in this world? Well, <clears throat> it's because He started with good people and they turned from Him and they became not so good people when they turn from God. Because there's no righteousness in any of us. The only righteousness you and I can claim is Christ in our hearts. The rest of it's just no good. <laughs> Isaiah said it's like filthy rags. You, you know, even the best of us. So, that that is simply saying, He made all the first things, He will also make these last things. And He reiterates it to John when He said... Write this down. In Revelation, in the first chapter of Revelation, in verse 19, he says the same thing to John. He says, verse 1 and 19, uh-oh, I missed it somewhere. I'm in verse chapter 2. No one. <laughs> Write the things which you have seen and the things which are, and now here's the last, and the Things which will take place after this. So he's writing the last things now. He said, write what you've already seen, John. Write what you're seeing now. And then I want you to write what you're going to see. So here at the end of this thing, he, he says, write because these words, they are faithful and true. Why? Because the first words came true. And God kept them, so these will be the same. Faithful. <clears throat> the first words, everything that God said is going to happen, happened. So he simply tells John, I'm the same God. I made all that happen, and I'm going to make all this happen. I had the power to bring you to this point, and I've got the power to take you further. So you can write that knowing that these words are faithful and that they are true. And in verse 6, 6 and 7 go together. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely. To him who thirsts, he who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. He is all in all. That's why the Apostle Paul made the statement 
It is in Him that I live and move and have my very being. We, we do nothing on our own apart from Him. He's all in all. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Sometimes you, you, you look at that and we kind of think that there was a starting point and that there's an ending point. But really, that language in the Latin speaks of infinity. When, when he says, I am the Alpha, he's saying, even before there was a beginning was me. Even before the beginning. He had no beginning and He has no end. See? He, he has... God always was. It, it's God. Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. Before there were ever any humans, it was God. Before there were ever any angels, it was God. Where did God come from? Let me give you my regular answer. I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> All I know, he's he's here now. That's yeah, and he's going to be there then. <laughs> he was here when I got here. And He's going to be there when I leave here. And that's all I really worry about. When I was up at the children's home, I think I told you that story about that little boy. He, he was a tough guy. He was 16. He was, he was <clears throat> at that time, I was trying to think of what they called them. They had the bald heads. And they wore the army boots. And you know they were, they were the real rough characters. Who, who were they? I mean, they, it, it, was, it was a group of them. But anyway, they were, they were rough dudes. You know, they all shaved their heads, and, and he was one of that group that, that did that. And he, he, had, he was riding with his uncle up the interstate, and his, his uncle wrecked, driving drunk. And, of course, they took him into custody, and they brought the boy to the emergency cottage. That's who I got to talk to. I got to talk to kids that were only there. They couldn't be there for more than two weeks. So they were constantly in and out. And when I would go, I'd go every Thursday evening. I never knew. Sometimes it'd be some of the same group. And then sometimes it'd be totally new people. And I went at skinheads. That's what I was trying to think of. And I went in there, and, and he was down the hall, and Jack and Laura, who were the house parents, and they used to bring the kids to church here. When they would let them take them off campus, Jack and Laura would bring them to church here. And anyway, when I went, Jack met me at the door, and I went in, we did the study like in the living room, and Jack said, we got a kid up here. And he said, <clears throat> he's kind of rough. You know, he's, I think he's from New York, actually. And he, he told me his story, and he said, uh, I mentioned something about Bible study, but he said, I don't know. I said, yeah, Jack, yeah, so let's go talk to him. So I went down the hall, talked to him. He was standing there in the hall, and I said, how about coming to Bible study? He said, well, I can do that. I said, yeah, come on, he come on in, and he sat down. And the whole time I was talking, he just kept staring me down, man. I mean, he just, Kept looking, he kept looking me. He didn't know I was from Ivanhoe. He didn't know that it might have changed. He had never heard of Ivanhoe, but he kept staring me down. And and then I got I always asked the same question to the new guys. I always ask him. I said, uh, I, I want to know what your thoughts are about God. Who do you think He is? Or if you even think there is a God, if you think there is a God, how do you picture picture this God? Uh, do do you think anything along that line? What do you think about it? And he stomped his foot and clapped his hands. He said, I don't know and I don't care. So I adopted that. Are there some things I have to say to that? But you know, he turned out, he turned out real nice. It really did. Uh, I got to know him a little bit that day. And it was just kind of touch and go. <clears throat> but when I went back the next week, he was still there. And Jack said, he's not coming to Bible study tonight. And I said, well, that's okay. So after we did it, I said, can I go talk to him? And Jack said, don't you stir nothing up of that boy. I said, I ain't going to stir nothing up with him, Jack. I'm just... So I went to his room, and when I went in his room, he, he was sitting there on the bed, and he had shaving cream all over his hands. I mean, just playing with it. shaving cream, just a big ball. And I said, Tim, that was easy. I said, Tim, can I come in and sit down? He said, suit yourself, you know. So I did, and I sat down on the bed beside of him. And I said, we missed you, but I understand you don't have to you don't always have to come to Bible study. You don't have to come to a group. I said, I just want to 
just wanted to say hi to you, you know. And he said, well, you've said it. I said, okay. So we stood up, and he took that shaving cream, and he got between me and the door, and he had his black vest and his chain, and he put that right up to my face, and he said, what would you do if I put this all over your face? And I said, I do it about every day, man. (laughs) <laughs> ain't nothing to me. I mean, that's what I put on the shade. And it hit that kid and he died. He got to laughing. He laughed about that. And he said, wait a minute. And he went and he washed it off and he wiped it all off. And he come back and he sat down on the bed, watched me cry. And he said, I'm going to tell you why I don't want anything to do with church. He said, my mama went to church faithfully. She She would take us and we would go as kids. And said she was real, real faithful, real prayerful lady. Said she would pray for us and and said she got sick and died. Now he said, I don't want anything to do with a God that would do that to a kid. That that would give him give him a good mother and then take her away from him. And and you think, Oh Lord, what do you say? You know, I told you in the sermon, sometimes you just got to say, Oh Lord, yeah. So anyway, I said, well, but but you've made it, Tim. I mean, you're 16. I said, how old were you? He said, I was eight years old. And I said, but you've made it. You're, you're 16 years old. And I said, you know, your mama's with God. I mean, she's in heaven today. That's where she is. So I said, she's, she's taken care of, and apparently you've been taken care of. You've made it to this point. So I said, it, it's not by accident that things happen. And I said, if you want to see her again, Tim, I'm telling you, you better give some consideration to do that. He said, okay, okay. So I said, well, he said, are you coming back? I said, well, I'll be back next week. You know, at the same time. He said, well, okay. And I was walking down the hall to go to the door, and he stepped out the hall. <clears throat> and he said, hey, preacher. And I turned around and he said, I'll think about that. That's the last I saw him. He wasn't there the next week. Family had come and picked him up. But I'm expecting to see him in heaven one of these days because he got the word. And when you give people a word that way, those kind of people don't forget it. Uh, I mean, you can preach to church people all day, but when you've got somebody that their heart has been torn apart and God's able to touch it. That's what this world is not going to have to deal with. We're not going to have those kind of situations. You ain't going to have that to worry about in this new heaven and this new earth. God has no beginning and He has no end. And all those who are His will have no end. You and I had a beginning. We had a starting point. Just like Tim did when we come into this world. We had a starting point. But when you and I gave our hearts to Christ and we were born again and He gave us that spiritual rebirth, eternity for us started then. You and I aren't waiting on the resurrection. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Our eternity is is in our hearts already. So it's not like we're going to leave here and then go into eternity. We're living in eternity. We're on this earth during our span, but this is going to come to an end. You and I will never come to an end. And we will be with the one who had no beginning and the one who has no end. So that's that's the good thing about it. Hard to imagine that. I like a song that John sings, Where will you be a million years from now? Yeah. With Christ. That's where we're going to be. Verse 8. But the cowardly, cowards, the unbelieving, the abominable, Bigfoots, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's God's way of saying to John, excuse my grammar, Ain't none of that going to be there, John. None of these folk are going to be in this new heaven and this new earth. They're not going to have any idea about these things. 
The thoughts are never going to cross their minds. There is no sin in this world. The devil bought it into this world. The one that you and I live in now, the best one I've ever lived in so far, but the devil bought sin into this world in the Garden of Eden. But, there ain't going to be no devil to bring sin into that world. Because he's in the lake of fire and brimstone. John said, and all those who were his, that's where they are. So you're not going to have to, to even think that there's going to be another rebellion in regards to that. And there won't be. God will get rid of him and get rid of the rebellion at the end of the millennium. He will wrap it up with those who are left that come through the tribulation. That That's the sifting and it will all be done. That's why if you're born again, you can say, we are going to live happily ever after. And it's not going to be a fairy tale. It's going to be true. Isn't that good news? It is good news. Absolutely. I know when you're in the midst of trials and you're in the midst of troubles and things are going, you know, going tough and you know, fear or sickness or whatever it is, and and we talk about this new heaven and this new earth, and we talk about heaven, and just like with Sister Linkus, you know, when we say that that's where she wanted to be, and that's where she is. I mean, she's she's with the Lord that saved her and created her and made her. That's what she was in this thing for. And when we talk about that, it's hard to find consolates when you're in the midst of it now. But remember, the Lord had John write those words to a first century church that thought they were going to be wiped out by the government. They did. They, you know, the, the Romans, I mean, they were taking over the world and they was trying to crush Christianity. The Jews were trying to crush it and the government was trying to crush it. They, they was trying to do away with all of them. So God sent them this book so they could see the worst of times, but eventually it's going to be the best of times. I remember being in basic training. <laughs> First two weeks weren't too bad, but to sub that when I started the third week, I know now while some of the guys had calendars with big red X's marked on them <laughs> and a big circle around the day we graduated, <laughs> you start counting it down <laughs> when you're in the midst of it. And that's how it is in this world. When those times come and those heartaches come, we know what we know what's out there. We know what's in our future. And that makes all the difference. It's not a guess, it's not a hope so. John said, I saw it. I saw it. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I can take his word as good as anybody's. <laughs> I mean, he was with God and he knows God. So that's that's what I hold to. Questions or comments? These are fun lessons. Any any questions on it? Yes, D. You know, I, I I believe that that we will know who people are, but I don't think it's going to be in the context of how we know them now. now I know that sounds kind of complicated, but what I mean by that is what I mean by that is if if we knew that like say James was my fleshly brother, if I knew he was my fleshly brother and I was there and he wasn't there, I would know that too. See? But if I'm there and he's there and I know him as James, yeah, I'm not going to go back and say, you remember when we was down there at Draper, me and you was talking about this? That ain't going to happen. That ain't going to happen. He's going to be in his glorified body. I'm going to be in my glorified body. I'm going to know James. Just as Jesus knew Moses and Elijah and the disciples knew them. I'm going to know him because of the knowledge that God is going to give me. So, so I'll know him in that in that context of being one of the heavenly creatures, one of God's sons. He said, "I will be his God; he will be my son; or he'll be his child." See, in the kingdom, there's no gender of of man or woman, but we are as angels. 
And, and, and that means there's no, there's no sexuality involved with the glorified bodies. It's all about the Spirit. Yet we won't think the way we think now. We don't see the way we see things now. So, in knowing that, yeah, I believe we will know who is who. Now, they take the Scripture where Paul said, now I see things dimly while in this life. But he said, when I, when I get there, I'm paraphrasing what he says, he said, I will know as I am known. And, and people latch on to that and say, well, that means he's going to know people. And they're going to... but, but really what Paul is saying in the context of that verse is I don't know everything right now, but as soon as I get on the other side, I'm going to know as much then about that as I know about this now. I don't know everything about that now, but when I get over there, I'll know everything about that. That's what he was trying to get across. But I always go by Moses and Elijah at the transfiguration. Uh, I mean, the disciples that were with Jesus, they knew it was Moses and Elijah. So they bound to reckon they had never seen Moses and Elijah. They didn't have Facebook. <laughs> they didn't I mean, they didn't know what Moses really looked like or what Elijah really looked like. Think about it. I mean, they didn't have the history books and the pictures and all they just but God gave them that knowledge that they knew who they were. Now Jesus knew who they was. He always knew who they was. But the disciples had never seen him, but they said they wrote down in the Scripture under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And He said, that's Moses and Elijah. That's who that is. So that's how I believe that we will know who is who is from the knowledge that's given us. But it's not going to take us back down the lane of reminiscing. You know, it's, it's not going to be, oh, I remember you. Yeah, no you won't. No you won't. It, it'll be that you know that person at that time but you won't know if you knew them before or not. That that that's just it's it's a new it's a whole new dimension. It's a whole new dimension. So, and, and we really won't know until we're there. But I still like what Billy Graham says. I can't tell you exactly what it's going to be like, but I know it's going to be good. And it is, and it is. Does that help any? I've made you a watch. Yes, yeah, what time it was. So yeah, <laughs> but I, I mean it can be real complicated. So a lot of times you just fall back on, just like Billy Graham said. Can't answer all the questions. Doesn't matter. Don't know. Don't care. All I know is I'm born again, and when I get there, I'll know. Just as I know this life, I'll know that life, as Paul said. Make sense? going to be an interesting time, isn't it? Interesting. Interesting. All right. Anybody else? So he ain't asking him nothing. <laughs> Father, I thank You tonight. Thank You so much for these who are here. Thank You for those who are tuned in. But more importantly, thank You for Jesus. Because Jesus, if You had, if you had not come and obeyed the Father, if You had not done what He had given You to do, and, and I know there's no way that you would not have done it because He was within you. I know you never had a second thought about not doing it. I know that when you were in the garden and you asked if the cup could pass, you were talking about my sin. You didn't want my sin placed upon you because you'd never had sin. You still don't have any sin, but you was going to have to bear mine. So I can understand you as a holy God not wanting my sin, but you took it up on you anyway and died for it. And I thank You for that so that I can read this book. I can teach this class. We can talk about this new heaven and this new earth in reality. This is not a fairy tale. This is not a hope so, maybe so thing. This is prophecy. You made the first things happen. You're going to make those things happen. So help us as Your disciples to get that point across to the Tims in the world. To those who don't understand You. And they look at the judgments that take place and think that there could not be a God. 
So just help us to show them that that's a part that leads to the salvation. And we'll give you all the thanks. And we'll give you all the praise. And we'll give you all the glory when that day comes that we will be in that new heaven and in that new earth. In Your name, Jesus, we say it by faith. Amen and amen. God bless you. Pray for the service on Sunday. Thank you guys for watching.